2002, elections were held in Iraq. And guess who got 100% of the votes? Saddam Hussein. Of course. No big surprise there. But nothing like that could ever happen in our country, right? I think the American people are owed impeachment proceedings in the House of Representatives. Those who criticize the Patriot Act must listen. Year after year, within this happy throat, our fellowship bends thee for a space. A world where you only have choice on the surface, but in reality, you're a complete and total slave on a global plantation. People need to understand this administration lied to the nation about 9-11. Terrorism must be looked at from all points of the globe, not just America. I tried to warn the American people of the dangers that I saw emanating from this administration. The war on terrorism is a, is a thin cover for the war on dissent. They'll swear up and down a bill is going to give you more freedom, and it's actually uh, giving you a lot less. So to all the tyrants today and all the tyrants back in history and the tyrants to come in the future, you will be defeated. You have the spirits of evil working in the leaders and in the politicians and in the generals working with them. You have nothing but evil. You need to answer real questions instead of lying. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> you both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? A secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. This were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dictator, 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 I'm the giving you false choices so you think that you have a decision to make in the 2004 election. But either way, a blue blood from the East Coast wins. Words me, those guys were both members of the Secret Society at Yale, right? I have on my website, infowars.com. So we're not getting, this, this new guy is no better than the local Here's guy. the deal. If you believe Reuters, they're third cousins. If you believe the Associated Press, they're ninth cousins. They're both ninth cousins to Hugh Hefner. They're members of the same secret society, only 15 members each year, which admittedly was set up in 1832 to overthrow the U.S. And we only have 800 living members of that organization, but you can count their members as three presidents, eight CIA directors, many of the heads of the Fortune 500, and they work in concert together to bring you the unfolding police state, to bring you these criminal wars of aggression against sovereign, innocent nations. Bush, Kerry, and Hefner, odd cousins. Oh, CBS you found it. News. Well, understand, anything I right, spew I'm, out is ahead. documented up one side down yeah, the other. Do I don't care how crazy it sounds. You're right, though. Check this out. Hugh, hey, Hefner, Hugh Hefner was quoted as saying, I would be delighted to invite President Bush and Senator Kerry for a family reunion. CBS News confirms that Bush, Kerry, and Hefner are cousins. <laughs> It's very important to know that this film has been made in the course of the last 12 months. And time and time again on my own syndicated radio broadcast, and as we made this documentary, I said, look, it's going to be Carrie. Even when Dean was ahead of Carrie, I said, it's going to be Carrie. Think of that. Out of 290 million Americans, we have two people from the most elite secret society in the United States, only 15 members tapped or chosen each year and this is who we get for our presidential candidates. Out of 290 million, two people from the same organization that just chooses a couple people every year. It's absolutely incredible. Can you guys open website audio up on the air? Yeah. Actually, Vince you can go to uh, 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 infowars.com or prisonplanet.com right now, scroll down and it says Skull and Bones, and you can play the clip of Bush on Meet the Press a few weeks ago saying, yeah, oh, yeah. it's so secret I can't talk about it. Okay, let me play this. Yeah. 
You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but uh, look, I look for. Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. He kind of skipped over it, didn't he? Well, he just said it's so secret I can't talk about it. Now go down I under that. Oh, so he was serious? I thought he was, I thought he was right, kidding. Here's... Under that is Lord Carey on Meet the Press uh, about a month earlier. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction that he's taking the country. We can do a better job, and I intend to do it. And he laughs, too. Wow. Do you know, what, do, do you know what's interesting about that clip? They both gave the same answer, short the answer with and moved chuckle. on to the next subject with a chuckle. With a little chuckle that was in odd. between. No, I'm saying it's all staged. That's pretty weird. So we have these cousins who are members of the same secret society who have sworn an oath to each other above all other oaths. And they admit, even in the mainstream media, but laugh and say, oh, it's no big deal that these so-called leaders engage in bizarre occultic rituals. And it's so weird that the general public has trouble even interfacing with it. There's kind of a cognitive dissonance that we don't want to believe it. We cannot ignore it. It's right out in the open. What about the skull and bones? Uh, skull and bones uh, uh, obviously uh, gets a, a good deal of attention uh, simply because uh, A, it's, uh, it's secret. Uh, and B, uh, the members are, uh, uh, are people who uh, often turn up in high places later in life, and we'll certainly hear lots about it this year because both George W. Bush and John Kerry were members. Uh, most of the conspiracy theories that are, uh, that are out there now uh, tend to place a lot of emphasis on uh, the notion that there are interlocking secret organizations that uh, hold the real power in the world. And uh, because of its secrecy and because of the elite background of many of its members, uh, Skull and Bones is a prime candidate for that. Well, this isn't just the Skull and Bones when they're 22 or whatever. Uh, this is when they're old men at Bohemian Grove. And the point is, in the Trio Network documentary for my footage, they admit, yes, Mr. Jones got the ritual, yes, we're doing this, but it's just for fun. Well, the point is, is that it's a ritual about not having a conscience. It's the cremation of care. Boy, I wish I could have that one. Uh, Alex Jones has been talking about this for, uh, for quite a while. The Bohemian Grove, of course, is a privately owned Redwood Grove up in Sonoma County, north of San Francisco where every summer there is a get-together of the wealthy and, uh, and well-placed, all, uh, all male, who uh, get together for general cavorting, socializing, lectures, symposia, and so on, in an atmosphere that is completely removed from public scrutiny. Uh, Alex Jones and some others have uh, suggested for a long time that there are all sorts of nefarious rituals that go on. <laughs> I woke up one morning to learn that I had been attacked for an hour and a half on C-SPAN by Brian Lamb and some professor. And the professor gets up there and says, well, Mr. Jones claims he snuck into this place called Bohemian Grove, and Mr. Jones claims all these wild things. Look, I have the video. They admit I snuck in. It's been in the major newspapers on the West Coast, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, the uh, newspaper there in Santa Rosa, the Press Democrat. And I snuck in, and here were our so-called Christian conservative leaders worshiping Moloch. Year after year, within this happy grove, our fellowship ends thee for a space. I malevolence which would pursue us here has lost its power under these friendly trees. So shall we prune thee once again this night, and in the 
flames that keep thine effigy. We shall read the sign. Midsummer sets us free. From the Skull and Bones Society at Yale, founded in 1832, to the Bohemian Grove, founded in 1872. And that path has led us back to Monterio and the Bohemian Grove in Northern California. Here we are, my friends, three years later. There have been a lot of news articles and rumors about world leaders meeting and engaging in satanic rituals. Now, the news admitted that the world leaders met here every year, going back at least 75 years, with presidents coming here going back over 100 years ago. But we wanted to try to put the rumors to rest, find out if it was true. We snuck in to the Bohemian Grove, and I was able to catch one of their many rituals on tape, the cremation of care. And yes, the uh, leaders of the Bohemian Grove, based in San Francisco, have admitted that I did indeed sneak in and videotape the ritual. But they say I'm blowing it all out of proportion. They're just having fun. It's a theatrical production. Yes, our Christian conservative leaders meeting and engaging in an ancient Canaanite human sacrifice uh, reenactment ritual. It's uh, no big deal here in the uh, Transylvanian style woods of Northern California. The published annals of the Grove admit that the Manhattan Project developing the atom bomb was developed here. The Star Wars Project in the late 1970s was hatched at one of the Grove encampments. And I was stunned uh, in late 2004 to see two articles in the New York Times talking about the Bohemian Grove. Another article in the Wall Street Journal exposing Bohemian Grove but saying that it was no big deal. We pulled down the river, our truck got stuck. We get out, we go down, talk to the fire department, they come down to pull us out. We just say, hey, what's the Bohemian Grove? They begin threatening us to all turn the cameras off. Thanks a lot, buddy. So Brian, do you work at the Bohemian Grove? Yeah. Well, well, we're not here for that. No, I was asking him about it because I heard about it. Yeah. And he says you work there. Yeah. He's lying, he doesn't work there, sir. Well, he was telling me about about, you know, it's, it's like where the president goes and stuff. And so we were going to, like, talk to him, and then he's all alone. Hey, man, shut the camera off, huh? Here we are at the entrance to the 2,700-acre club that really begins a few hundred yards back there with uh, several guard shacks and, and uh, checkpoints. How's it going, bud? It says Bohemian Grove Security. We were driving through this town. And we asked what was in the town. They said the Pink Elephant, the Motel, and the Bohemian Club. We said, what's the club? They said, that's where these rich people go, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Then we asked a firefighter about it because our truck was stuck, and he freaked out and said, I'm not talking about it. Now we're interested. So uh, what goes on here? A resort for rich people. OK. Thanks. See you later. Here, let's stop and ask this person about the Grove. You guys know about the Bohemian Grove? What do you think of it? I've been here for 49 years. Been there 49 years? I've been here 49 years. What do you think of the Grove? Still there. I never worked up there or anything. But... Oh, yes, you have. I disagree. Yeah. Oh, he means we don't You're have the you. ID. Oh. Hey. Hi, I'm not. Come on, get in. Come. And neither is. Is that an electric eye? Yes. Cool. We're over here looking for a handbag. What do you think of the Bohemian Grove? Um, they throw a lot of parties up there. A lot of government officials come in and fly and fly out. I'd like to get one of their IDs. Oh, we've had that from... Get in, Chuck, girl. We think, what do we think of it? What is the Bohemian Grove? The Bohemian Grove is a man's uh, um, now they're men. party place, right? You are so full of... Oh, you said that because you're a man, and that's how you found out. <laughs> well, not being a man, I found out slightly differently. You found out about the Grove differently? Yeah, because I didn't go there as a man to party. I went there as a woman to party because, um, well, but, well, come on, Carol. Look, that's a valet, okay. Um, Have a good evening. Oh, uh, what? Where? What channel is this on? Should we it, follow it's you? It's not going to be on. We'll follow you. All right. Carol. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Take care. You're beginning to sink deeper into the rabbit hole now. <laughs> Find out about the Grove. This is a Twilight Zone like Lovecraft novel or something. Uh, 
I want to tell everybody out in TV land how they can come to the Grove, where their elected leaders, along with the big bankers and the heads of media, meet, along with some European royalty, every year to decide how to run the country. You can fly into San Francisco, or you can fly into Santa Rosa. You can even fly into Sacramento, and you know, well, you just drive out uh, to Highway 101. You take uh, Highway 12 out west towards the coast. You took it about 10 miles out from the coast, right outside the little town of Monterio. And the town of Monterio, off the main drag, uh, you'll take the Bohemian Avenue. And it dead ends right here at the 2,700-acre Redwood Grove uh, entrance, where your world leaders... Um, among other things, set policy for much of the planet and dress up in black and red robes and worship, uh, well, Moloch. They would say that Moloch was a Canaanite deity that children were sacrificed to. Uh, they don't say they worship Satan, they just worship an old deity that likes to gobble children, basically. It, it's so generational, they're so yeah. compartmentalized you go. at the top of the pyramid that they don't even know it. This is what they are. They're a beast just rending people. Yeah. And the people are allowing it to happen because they know nothing else. The modern dictatorship relies on what is euphemistically called mind control. Many Americans have accepted mind control and simply call it spin or advertising. Some people have wacky ideas like taxing gasoline more so people drive less. That's John Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to keep pounding, let me tell you. I'm just beginning to fight here. These guys are, these guys are the most crooked, you know, lying group that Bob ever seen. Who's crooked and lying? The president? Uh, I was talking about the attack machine. <laughs> <laughs> so this, in essence, is the American dictatorship. A world where you only have choice on the surface, but in reality, you're a complete and total slave on a global plantation, a feudal serf. I think the American people are owed impeachment proceedings in the House of Representatives. After all, the Congress ought to obey one provision of the U.S. Constitution that they are sworn to uphold. In March of 2004, on the one-year anniversary of the beginning of Gulf War II, a local peace group based in Dallas, Texas, requested that I come and speak after Ralph Nader, the popular consumer advocate who also ran for president in 2000. And I told him, look, I don't really support Ralph Nader. I think he'd obviously be better than George Bush or Al Gore. He could be a shill uh, put in there to ensure that Lord Bush gets in to office yet again. But I said that I doubt that because things are so obviously staged between the two uh, literal kissing cousins, the two coffin mates from Skull and Bones, Carrie and Bush, that I said, I'll be glad to go and give a speech uh, about the New World Order and hopefully wake up people on the supposed left. Because when you really get down to it, the left and right are controlled by the same people. I don't see that as really an accurate uh, reality uh, when you truly investigate the facts. Members of both parties were in complicity. They surrendered their sacred constitutional authority and gave the authority to declare war under his timing and place and manner unconstitutionally to George W. Bush. Nobody was indicted, nobody was prosecuted. You go out here in Texas and violate a, tex a, a traffic ordinance and you'll get a more severe penalty than the egregious violation of your own constitutional rights by the Congress of the President of the United States. And there were about 800 people there uh, there was one peace group that had gotten time there at the city park in Crawford, Texas, right outside George Bush's uh, Hollywood set where he struts around acting like a cowboy and not a British royal blue blood from Kenningbunkport, Maine. And we got there and the people that had brought in um, Ralph Nader, the, the state coordinators, they wanted me to speak uh, and they had actually gotten the time for Ralph Nader at 5 p.m. But when it got time for me to go up and introduce Ralph Nader, uh, the so-called peace group from Austin, Texas uh, was outraged and the UT professor was outraged and uh, they began trying to keep me from, from speaking. And I nicely went ahead and gave them the microphone back and then we had to ha have some of the local authorities explain to them that indeed Ralph Nader's group had invited me in to speak and that indeed 
uh, I was supposed to then go and introduce him. The military industrial complex runs the red light cameras, the cameras in the schools, the private prisons. That's what it's all about. They are setting up a Nazi Germany type system here domestically. And you know what? I want to thank the folks that put this together. Lori Tice and others, they're the ones that brought R uh, Ralph Nader in. And the local folks are great too, but it's 5 o'clock or I'm supposed to be up here. But here they are because, well, they love talking to crowds. God bless you. I'm coming up later to expose the New World Order. Stay with us. Yeah! Just amazing activity. The fissures we see even in the so-called uh, peace movement. And their abject fear of me because I'm pro-gun, pro-national sovereignty, uh, and against the tyranny of the Democratic Party. Bill Clinton did a lot to destroy our liberties and freedoms because he's a tool of the elite. Bill Clinton helped protect bin Laden when Sudan and Afghanistan wanted to arrest him. Uh, he was just carrying out the policy of the CIA as an active puppet for the globalist. But they couldn't seem to figure that out. They can't understand that, that if we're going to get our country back, so-called right-wingers and so-called left-wingers and libertarians are going to have to come together and, and, and really get outside the box and see the big picture. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I want to see if I get up here they magically appear again. Seriously, if we're going to defeat this global tyranny, the left and right have to wake up to the fact that left and right is a fraud. Only difference between George W. Bush and John Forbes Carey well, they're cousins, they're members of Skull and Bones. Their voting record is almost identical. Think about that. Their voting record is almost identical. They both voted for the war. They're all for the same issues. That's the key here. And I have to tell you that after having a chance to talk to Ralph Nader's staff, after being able to interview Mr. Nader, uh, I do think that there is a well-founded suspicion by a lot of Democrats that Ralph Nader is acting, whether unconsciously or consciously, as a agent to throw the election to George W. Bush. The Democrats say anybody but Bush, whereas in reality, it really doesn't matter. Either way, they've got this election fixed. As we said, this is the American dictatorship where the elite gets their man, their puppet, their figurehead in the position of power. We were partially responsible, our government was partially responsible for Saddam Hussein, as we were supporting any so-called anti-communist dictator in the world. Along with the British, we helped entrench him as a dictator of Iraq in 1979. We equipped him with arms. We gave him foreign assistance and credits. We had our corporations apply and receive export permits from the Department of Commerce in the 1980s under the Reagan and Bush one administration, providing this brutal dictator with the raw materials for chemical and biological warfare. In 1983, Donald Rumsfeld, special envoy, visited Saddam Hussein when these materials were being used and didn't say anything. He was our dictator after all, wasn't he? He was our dictator. The U.S. government has overthrown over 50 dictators since World War II without invading them. They're experts at overthrowing not our dictators, the other side's dictators. It's interesting just to speculate. Why in the world, knowing that he's a tottering dictator with disloyal troops ready to run at a moment's notice and surrounded by enemies, why in the world didn't the U.S. government under George W. Bush merely overthrow him instead of invade Iraq? There's a three-letter word for that, folks. Oil! Oil! What did we see in the last election between Albert Gore and George W. Bush in 2000? We saw two different rival factions inside the New World Order fighting for control, fighting for the management position of CEO of the New World Order, of Slavery Incorporated. It's clear that Al Gore did win the popular vote. It's not clear if that popular vote was actually his or if Democratic operatives uh, had stuffed ballot boxes 
and manipulated votes at the local level to the point of him winning by a narrow margin. But what is clear is that George W. Bush and different members of the constabulary in Florida and other states did steal the election, did block recounts, did disregard numbers that showed that Al Gore had indeed won the election. And then when that was in question, the Supreme Court, seven of the nine members appointed by Republicans, then returned the favor and appointed George Walker Bush as the president of the United States. We're talking about a dictatorship of the mind where the people are scared into absolute submission. Did you ever imagine that you would see the federal government up on television saying, well, the terrorists may want to disrupt our democratic process, so we're going to have to disrupt the democratic process. We may need to cancel or suspend the election if there's a threat or if there is a terrorist attack. But I thought the terrorists want to disrupt our elections, so why would you now try to disrupt the elections? How obvious, how transparent, how see-through is that? There was a case in Tennessee where the tabulation software added illegally a quarter of a vote to the favored candidate for every one vote that the unfavored candidate received. Now that was flat out wrong, but because this particular unfavored candidate had Judge Joe Brown on his side, they were able to sue and find out exactly what happened. So we understand that these manipulations are going to take place. ESNS, election system software. Republican Senator Chuck Hagel, who is he? He's got ownership ties to a holding company into the, to ESNS. Well, he's a 20 year friend of the Bush family. He almost became our vice president instead of Dick Cheney. And he won his seat in the Senate twice by these big landslides in Nebraska in a state that had not elected a Republican senator in over 24 years. But you know what? The votes were counted, 80% of his votes were counted by ESNS voting machines. Maybe it's a little coincidence, I don't know. Don't know. It's very important for everyone out there to spend time looking at the election process in your county and your city. While Americans are being fed a steady diet of Michael Jackson and Lacey Peterson and lots of football, our elections are being stolen by the owners and controllers of electronic voting machine companies by rigged software and no paper audit trails. And time is running out for us to do something about it. I spoke to Libertarian Distinguished Speaker Series here in Austin, Texas, and I have to tell you, I was delighted when I told the crowd of several hundred people that if anybody here disagrees with me, uh, please ask a question, please state why. And no one said that they disagreed with me. This shows that we're winning the intellectual battle, that a mass awakening, a renaissance is taking place. And that's the best news I can give you. You know how when a tornado is coming or an earthquake, and they've done studies of this at major universities, mice, dogs, cats, get restless, start running around, get upset, sometimes hours, some cases even days before. They have that sixth sense. They, they have that instinct. They have that, that survival mechanism uh, deep inside them. And we all have that too as the most advanced creature on this planet. But it's pushed to the side by modern culture. We're supposed to ignore it. So the point I'm trying to make is deep down, people know that something is wrong. Deep down, people are ready to move and stand up against the new world order. And it was exciting to be able to hear the speaker before I spoke who detailed uh, just some of the key smoking guns and bullet points and red flags concerning industrialized election fraud. In 2002, elections were held in Iraq. And guess who got 100% of the votes? Saddam Hussein, of course. No big surprise there. But nothing like that could ever happen in our country, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what if I were to tell you today that virtually any hacker with a laptop could hack into the electronic voting machines that are being used in most of the states across our country that are going to be used by 50 million Americans in November while they're voting for president, adding votes, changing votes, and changing the final tally without being detected. Uh, the work that you heard earlier 
I'm uh, being spoken about with the electronic voting machines is very, very serious. This is the arrogance of government. And you can see that they're getting more and more arrogant, more and more aggressive. And that's been the norm throughout history. Governments are tyrannical, powerful, ruthless people always seek to get into positions of greater control. That's just been human history, but somehow the mainstream media mind washers over the last 50 years have convinced the general public, the middle class namely, that government is nothing but good, it never does anything wrong, anybody that questions it or wants to limit it is crazy. The law enforcement handbooks and manuals and the videos I've been sent by police of what FEMA and Homeland Security is teaching them, doesn't matter if it's Democratic administrations or if it's George W. Bush, it's horrible. They're saying that if you question government, if you get involved, if you speak out, you're bad. And that's a classic example and a key indicator of tyranny out of control. Well, one of the things that I think we need to rely on is, uh, you know, the fact that there's a long tradition in America separating the military from the police. Um, George Washington, for instance, you know, refused kingship, um, you know, was, was, was offered this title. Um, but refused to take on that role, um, suggesting that you know it, it was not uh, right for uh, a movement in those days that was about um, opposing the uh, state, you know, the, the quartering of soldiers in people's houses and so forth. It was an anti-militarism that sort of founded this country, and, and the separation between the military and the police is kind of the, the foundation upon which our democracy is built. So I think one of the things that people need to look at is the ways in which that we can recodify the Posse Comitatus Act, the, the Posse Comitatus Act being the criminal statute which bars the military from enforcing laws domestically. Austin, Texas is known as the live music capital of the world, and Oza Motley is a Grammy award-winning band that has no history of causing any problems. They came to Austin, their venue was totally jam-packed, in the middle of their set, the fire marshal requested that they help get the crowd outside because it was overflowing. When they did that, police from outside rushed in on them and said, get people back in the bar. Don't have them come out on the sidewalk. This was all caught by tourists on tape as they peacefully complied. But the police were already in that mad dog mentality and began assaulting the crowd with tear gas and then arresting members of the band, including the manager, and charging some of them with felonies. Despite the fact that nothing illegal was caught on tape and no one resisted them. This is becoming a very serious pattern, not just in Austin, Texas, but around the country. I went to Cuba, you know, for like 10 days. And this is supposed to be a dictatorship, you know, truly, you know, uncut, you know. And uh, I was walking around pretty drunk on Cuban rum. And a Cuban police officer totally treated me with like a respect and a help that I would have never gotten in L.A. So, so what you're saying is, as Americans, and I've experienced this, we think we're free, but we go to foreign countries that are supposedly dictatorships, and they're freer than we are, and the police treat you with more respect than we get here in this country. Well, I don't know if necessarily freer would be the, 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 the actual thing. I think it's more of just how uh, police are viewed, and how they're trained, and how they actually work in that particular society, or in that particular country and culture. So why are they getting so arrogant? Why are they laughing at us? Why are they being so out in the open about the despotism that they're engaging in, this command and control system they're setting up? It is in large part because of the electronic touchscreen, uh, no record voting systems they're putting in. Three of the major companies have former deputy directors of the CIA on their board of directors. The local voting machine company that uh, we all supposedly vote on is in large part controlled and owned by Clear Channel. Clear Channel, and of course Clear Channel is a globalist organization, basically an intelligence operation. And we have Clear Channel, uh, Mr. Mays' uh, son-in-law, just married to his daughter, is uh, Michael McCall. And uh, he's the guy 
uh, who's married to the daughter, they're the biggest campaign contributors to him in the new District 10 uh, runoff race that's coming up. No Democrats running against him. Think about that. He's married to the daughter. The Clear Channel is the biggest contributor to his campaign, and they own the electronic voting machines. And the county clerk, David Dubois, tells us there's going to be no paper ballot. You're not going to have a record. There's going to be no receipt of it. And why would you, you don't trust us, she says? Well, no, you just got caught in 1998, double counting ballot boxes, falsifying signatures and breaking safety seals. But the state board looked at it and said it was all a complete accident. And, and that was with the old system where they had to feed the paper ballots in, then it went into an electronic spreadsheet and that too could be manipulated. But now with these new systems, there's just no record at all. Just another quick update for you in the course of making this documentary. We talked about Michael McCall running for a new special created 10th district here in Central Texas. And then magically, despite the facts saying that he would lose according to polls, he magically won, just like Senator Hagel, who owned the voting machine company, and he ran as an underdog way behind the polls, and he magically won too. So you're wondering why government's getting more and more arrogant? They own the voting machines. Out of the five big voting machine companies, three of them are headed by former CIA deputy directors or directors. One of the other big ones is run by the former head of the National Security Agency or the NSA. And then again, others are owned by people like Clear Channel. So I think that answers the question for you. But they know that you can't handle the horror of this. And then we've got the League of Women Voters, a supposed political watchdog group running all over the country trying to block a good Republican's bill, Congressman Rush Holt's bill, to demand a paper record of the electronic voting machines. They're blocking that, saying, no, we don't want any record of how you vote. Don't be a conspiracy theorist. You're bad if you want a record. We send advisors and monitors all over the planet to these third world countries, these ten horn dictatorships to monitor their elections. And we demand a paper trail, but here, hey, don't be paranoid. We just don't want you to have that record. Better think about that. Uh, why is it that you believe what Alex Jones tells you? Uh, because he, uh, he makes a lot of sense. There are just too many coincidences um, about the whole situations. I watch a lot of history. I watch a lot of PBS. I do not watch propaganda. Uh, as Hitler said, it is easier to believe a big lie than a little lie. A lot of you have already instinctively known that something was wrong on 9-11. But you're still saying, how could elements of the government do something so horrible? How could they carry something out like this? Well, look what happened to millions of American Indians. Look what happened to African Americans because of criminal elements in the government and individuals that stood to gain by their enslavement, by their murder. So don't be naive. Look at history. Look at what all the dictators have done. Look at what's gone on in kings and queens' courts. Look at the subterfuge they had going on a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, and then magnify that today. It's very naive to look at all the motives that the military industrial complex had for 9-11 and then to look at all their connections with the Taliban, with the Al-Qaeda, with training the supposed hijackers, with giving public officials warnings. You cannot deny what's developing here, what's happening. See, they know that people are on to the fact that 9-11 is a cover-up, that there was prior knowledge, and yes, even government involvement and founding of groups like Al-Qaeda. And so they put on this big WWF wrestling spectacle, this staged event, much like the election. Many of the members, business partners with the Bushes, business partners with the Bin Ladens. Remember when they first set up the commission, they tried to have Dr. Henry Kissinger as the head of it, and the media called him the independent chairman. Well, this new independent commission is no more independent than Dr. Henry Kissinger was going to be as the chairman. What we really need is a, is a bipartisan congressional inquiry, which has been proposed by some members of Congress, but the leadership by the Republicans has blocked it. Someday the truth will come out about how $30 billion of intelligence budgets a year uh, could uh, follow the tracks of these attackers uh, that were uh, apparent for four years before the September 11th attack and were signaled 
to the headquarters in Washington in some fashion by the field offices of, of two FBI officers in, in, uh, in the field. So a bipartisan response. From day one, the 9-11 Commission said they weren't going to address any blame in the government. They were going to call for recommendations. And before they even had their whitewash investigation, they said, we're going to call for Patriot Act II. We're going to call for a giant domestic CIA spying on every American, just like the KGB or the GRU. And then they were going to give us their findings after the election. But after there was some criticism, they said, OK, we'll bring you our findings beforehand. And then, the day after they announced their findings, calling for a domestic CIA to keep us all safe from ourselves, they have another fake terror alert, which admittedly later was fake. But what a nice backdrop to scare the people into going along with this. The 9-11 Commission, we can make a whole film about this. The whole thing is a fraud. And I read their final report. I went through the whole thing. and. It, it would take an encyclopedia to counter all the lies and misrepresentations that are in it. I would just challenge everybody to understand that any commission appointed by those being investigated is not independent. Powerful people at the pinnacles of success are there in many cases because they are ruthless, because they could care less about anyone but themselves. They'd sell their mother out for a piece of bubble gum. And again, history has shown that. Say, wait a minute, you say G.W. Bush. George Bush engineered the attacks on the World Trade Center. Well, the people that... Yeah. That guy says he's subliminable. A, he, he's a front man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying the brand Nigeria name... Nigeria is an important the brand, continent. Look, George Bush is the, is the red coating on the Coca-Cola can. He's the brand front. But back at the factory, you know, the guys at the factory, <laughs> you know, the New <laughs> World Order <laughs> top of his game. That's the A game right there. Do you know what W199I is? That's your locker combination. That's <laughs> W1, <laughs> you better, it's deadly serious. You better know what W199I is. Okay, all right, here we go. Get a okay. pen. <laughs> Two months before September 11th, George Bush signed it, ordering all FBI and defense intel officers they would be arrested under national security violation if they stopped the Al-Qaeda terror rings in Chicago, Florida, New York, and New Jersey. The deputy head of the FBI... Why would he let me give you the facts and you go check it out for yourself. By anyways, order, deputy I'll FBI order. director John O'Neill mm -hmm. quit released the document and was dead on September 11th, okay? And the documents out there, I had David Shippers on, General Parton, all these people. It was he just died a, on September 11th? Yeah, he, he died on the 24th floor in the, of the World Trade Center. Okay. He, he had just oh, been he hired. On, he was on the trade. He, he had just trade been center. hired by the owners of the Trade Center right after quitting. He thought it was a great deal. He didn't see the full scope. The Rockefeller family, along with the Port Authority, owned those towers. And it just transferred it two weeks before the attack, but he'd already been hired. His first day on the job. He was taken out. He's the guy that blew the whistle preemptively. It's in the New Yorker magazine, uh, just one of the 500 publications. On PrisonPlanet.com and InfoWars.com, we have over 600 9-11 smoking guns, or what we call red flags. Each one of these issues is enough to bring down the official story surrounding 9-11. Bottom line, their official story or fable is impossible, has been disproven at hundreds of levels. And they never respond once they've been proved to be liars. They just simply try to change their story. I got news for you. The earth, the world is round. You can put me in prison for saying it's round. But I'm telling you, buddy, one day, everybody's going to know it's round. And the world isn't the center of the universe either. The world is round. The world, I'm here to tell you, they want to kill you and your family. They're putting cancer viruses in the vaccines. These mothers have created every monster you can imagine. And I do this because I believe in this country. And I believe in humanity and our power to create something. That's right. And I'm fighting total dehumanization. And everything I told you is deadly serious. That's the A game, folks. You don't get much time. smiling right afterwards. it's true, man. That's the A game, bitch. With that. Gary, sir, world history, tyranny, tyrants, how do we deal with the general public not even being aware of the fact that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? I mean, people before us, our founding fathers knew you got to restrict government, you got to restrict control over our lives because bad men will get control of those mechanisms. 
the government's just a tool, but you don't want to build the tool, the device that can enslave and destroy. Do you have any comments to that? Yeah, through history, through the beginning of time, we've been learning that power is the ultimate achievement. No matter how the power comes, no matter how you use it, if you're in power, no matter how it is, negative, positive, indifferent, stoic, nothing. But if you feel you have power, and whatever way you use that feeling to give you the power you have, whether it be tyranny, wars, I mean, the greatest oxymoron of them all is holy war, which is not in God's plan. The poor people of the Middle East, the Islams and the Muslims, and uh, the Arabs and the Taliban, the Afghanistans, the Pakistanis, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey, Israel, the Palestinians, they all have a purpose on this earth but they're not using the purpose God gave them to use. They're using the fear that they have by not using God's purpose. Traveling around the United States, do you see the mentality, uh, the, the militarization of police intensifying? Do you see it getting worse? Or, or is the vibe getting worse? Well, yeah, I would say so. Definitely. I mean, since, I mean, even since September 11, I just think overall, all authority has stepped it up a notch. Douglas MacArthur. Another general who cannot be accused of being soft. He said in 1957 to the American people, beware of gov your government exaggerating foreign threats in order to expand military budgets. We're talking about $3 trillion in oil in Afghanistan, $4 trillion in Iraq, hundreds of billions of dollars in weapon sales and occupation cost. And Dick Cheney hasn't even allowed uh, bids to be taken. Halliburton and, and Bechtel and a handful of other corporations that put Bush in office have made all the profits. Our sitting vice president taking a paycheck. I can't even believe I'm saying this. Taking a paycheck from the American people while at the very same time Taking one from a corporation that gets billions and billions of dollars in no bid sole source contracts should make us all outraged and the vice president should blush. But these people don't blush because in the end, they know they can get away with it. It's about setting the precedent to mobilize the people behind this global war for what PNAC, the president's own organization, says is a war for global domination and setting up a domestic police state, getting rid of posse comitatus, putting troops on the streets, getting Patriot Act 1 passed, trying to pass Patriot Act 2. Okay, type in Project for New American Century. That's where Dick Cheney, two years before Bush got elected, said we need terror attacks to scare the people into submission so we can get the oil. Saddam's not a threat. It's all about using that as a military base. Uh, type in Operation Northwoods. It's on my website, but you'll go to the Library of Congress. The official U.S. government plan to carry out 9-11. It is declassified, ABC News, Baltimore Sun. Official U.S. government plan to carry out 9-11. Mayor Willie Brown of San Francisco getting a call from the White House, being told the night of September 10th not to fight in New York that morning. And then Condoleezza Rice and all the rest of them get up there on TV with the Kingpin, Richard Armitage, and Colin Liar Powell and tell you they never had any prior knowledge. They're a pack of liars. And they're getting power out of these attacks that they helped engineer with their business partner, Osama bin Laden. And don't worry, his stage capture's coming up. Some people think that the response to 9-11, to that act of war that was committed against us, to the people who, who tried to decapitate us on that day and shut down our financial system, that the, uh, that the response to that ought to be limited war. We'll win in Afghanistan, we'll kill bin Laden, and uh, we'll return to defensive position. This president believes that it's a broad war, that you not only have to deal with Afghanistan, but you've got to deal with the circumstances uh, in the Middle East that have created al-Qaeda, created the ideologies of hatred that are, are driving them, that you've got to have a peaceful and stable Iraq as a linchpin of a different kind of Middle East. People need to understand this administration lied to the nation about 9-11. They lied about Iraq and 9-11. They lied insisting Iraq worked with Al-Qaeda in 9-11. They lied about uh, saying there were weapons of mass destruction. They lied in order to justify an attack on Iraq. Their, their ulterior motives were very transparent. They were looking to control 
the oil, to be able to give contracts out, to be in a position where they could dominate the politics of the region and use that as a platform to control other nations in the region. I mean, the whole thing is unmasked, but the American people love their country, they're ready for the truth, and we shall take the truth forward. You shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. It's very important to consciously connect the dots and focus in on one of the central issues. Bush has given all these speeches, you're either with us or against us. Either with us or against us. You're either evil or you're good. All of this is happening and they're saying we're going to arrest anybody who's got any connections to the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. Then you've got the U.S. government flying 8,000 of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, the cream, out to Pakistan. You've got the U.S. government founding the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in 1979, building them up to the 1980s for the war against the Soviets. And then Bush is giving all these speeches about how we've got to go after anybody who has connections to bin Laden. No one has connections to the bin Laden family like the Bushes and to Osama himself. In fact, Osama bin Laden was an admitted CIA asset, we believe still is, and his code name, admittedly, was Tim Osmond. In the 1970s, he was in the U.S. with a short hair and no beard. Well, there's been photos out there of him driving around in his Cadillac, hanging out with the CIA. His older brother founded uh, Arbusto Oil with George W. Bush, his first big contract out of college in 1976 in Midland, Texas, while they owned an airport together in Houston. But again, the media, there's been a few articles, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, BBC. But that's it, folks. So we need to look at the motive, we need to look at the history, we need to look at how the president is intimately involved with the Bin Ladens. In fact, we've got FBI agents who were ordered by Bush under W199I, a presidential order, several months before 9-11 to back off the Bin Laden family, to back off Al-Qaeda in this country. He threatened, Bush did, to arrest FBI agents if they stopped Al-Qaeda. They knew specifically what the hijacking plans were. In fact, FBI agent Robert Wright with uh, David Shippers, the man that impeached Bill Clinton, and uh, Larry Klayman of Judicial Watch gave a press conference last year before the National Press Club. And they said, here's the letter from the Justice Department. We'll be arrested if we tell you what we know about the Bushes and the Bin Ladens. But Larry Klayman said this, all I can tell you is the Bushes vacation with the Bin Ladens. Bush has taken over the media. In fact, that's one of the offices that some of his people are involved in. No, media and, 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 and Bush merging together, and I'm glad to see a lot of the media is starting to resist that. This is Dude, are you on crack? The media what? is owned by the same corporations hey, hold that on. own Bush. That put them in They're the power. They're owned by the hey, same people. And Carl Rowe, the uh, Ed White House Satan. guy, has been going around saying, don't put out anything that criticizes the government. That's Work with us. Absolutely and they're involved untrue. That's and totally that true. is absolutely untrue. That's I was in both of those meetings. Sir, I read his quote. I was in both of those meetings. There was true. Quotes. Come on now. I saw the mom. He's dead. Don't fight. I was there. I saw it on C SPAN. One of the biggest holes in their argument is the fact that they never heard of a plan to fly hijacked jets into landmarks on the East Coast. We're going to take a closer look tonight at another example of where, despite the conventional wisdom, there were people in the United States who actually were preparing to defend against the kind of attacks which occurred here on 9-11. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD for short, has been defending the skies over the U.S. and Canada for almost 50 years, 46 to be precise. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. We knew he hated us. But there was uh, nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. But that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attack. And so then I saw Condoleezza Rice get up on TV and say, we had never thought, we had never heard. Why, well, that's a ridiculous conspiracy theory to say that. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game, having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon.
The truth is pouring out in the media. You can hardly keep up with it. It's even coming out on Fox TV. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly went on national TV to say he was wrong. He was wrong. He admitted he was wrong. That's, that's big of him. Most, most of these people never admit they were mistaken. But the most telling evidence came from President Bush's favorite and chief arms inspector in Iraq, David Kay, who after spending 500 million of your tax dollars in recent months with 1,500 skilled inspectors, returned home to report to his commander in chief, and he said, with further elaboration, he said, quote, we were wrong, end quote. We were wrong. I remember candidate George W. Bush saying that actions should have consequences, that actions should involve responsibility. We never engage in a rush to judgment. We study things over time. And I, I said that I wasn't sure about Ralph Nader in earlier segments of this film, but now I'm even more sure, my friends, that he's a tool to give us the illusion of choice. Not only is one of his former top lawyers and campaign managers a Skull and Bones member, but now we learn that Mr. Nader's book was published by Fox Television, and he's been all over Fox promoting it. Now, again, I'm not saying that, oh, this is some plan to get Bush elected because we know that Nader takes votes away from Kerry, but it's just an added level of this Byzantine uh, Machiavellian subterfuge that we should all be conscious of. Mr. Nader, who are you really working for? The war on terrorism, particularly in its homeland defense manifestation, is a, is a thin cover for the war on dissent. A lot of prominent individuals have come out against the war. And they're not all what you'd call leftists. Mel Gibson has come out against the Iraq war. He said that it's wrong, that it's unconscionable, that it's a crime, that it's not America's place. And you know, Mel Gibson is just in line with George Washington, who said, don't get involved in foreign entanglements. Don't get involved in imperialism that was the norm at his time in the world, and is still the norm today, just more sophisticated, more veiled. Power is a gift we have to utilize within ourselves for others in the best way possible. The paradigm of power is the highest standard of power, and that simply is giving. For 50 years under both parties, our government has been sporting brutal dictators who suppress their workers and their presence. Why don't we have a war on global infectious diseases that are taking millions of innocent lives and are coming to this country in drug-resistant strains? This is what it's all about, coming out here against tyranny, not as liberals or conservatives, but just as human beings that love freedom and are standing up against the establishment and saying, we are not your slaves. Throughout history, there's different types of power, and there's power people that are powerful because they do good things and they do it for the right reasons. Why is it though really dark, evil, wicked people who are sadistic and enjoy doing bad things to populations, enjoy mutating populations spiritually, physically, financially, why do those type of individuals normally get into power and then once they have power, no one's challenging them, they increase the murder, the slaughter. How do we stop, well number one, why do we see that happen or do you agree? And then number two, how do we stop that? A lot of the people who are under the power of the tyrants are like sheep. They know nothing else. They have no role models. This is from generation to generation to generation, and they come with generational curses, and they come from the spirits of evil, and there's 14 of them that are listed in the Bible. And when you have these spirits of evil working with you, within you, around you, and you have the spirits of evil working in the leaders and in the politicians and in the generals working with them, you have nothing but evil, nothing but evil. And the most endangered species is dedicated leaders. I mean, good leaders. I mean, dedicated leaders in the right way, in the good way. You have to limit government power and the intrusiveness of government and take away the need for the money that they come after us for. Yeah. You 
seeing a lot of uh, a lot of lying by the Attorney General. Comments about the new Victory Act, Patriot Act II, and the lying. Well, you know, I pointed out in my speech just a little while ago that uh, he had a beautiful quote when he was a senator. I mean, they flip-flop and they deceive. Uh, I don't think he would admit that he was doing any lying, but he, uh, he now serves a different master. He serves uh, the administration, and if they say, this is what you're going to do, he goes along with it. So it's just total inconsistency. That's why we need people in government that are willing to stand up for their beliefs and, and explain what they believe in, and they shouldn't be allowed to stay there, you know, if they flip-flop and just do whatever they feel like doing. George W. Smirks. Dick Cheney sneers, Rumsfeld jokes, power blusters, rice lies, Enron and WorldCom steal, DynCor vaccinates, Halliburton feeds and feeds and feeds and feeds. Americans hurt, and in Iraq, Americans die. Our national leaders insult our allies, create more foes, reward their friends, increase our insecurity through their own policies, and plunge the American people into the deepest economic abyss of a generation. Stealing an election in Florida on the uncounted chads, representing the legitimate hopes and aspirations of blacks and Latino Floridians, even the Democrats failed to pursue a remedy that would permanently secure the voting rights of people of color in Florida and around our country. Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, who was targeted by her own party, as well as the Republicans, was routed out of her popular congressional seat covering Atlanta, Georgia. And when she found out about the United Nations and DynCorp kidnapping hundreds of thousands of women and children and being found guilty in court of doing it, she went public. When she found out about the Bushes of the Bin Ladens and prior knowledge of 9-11, she went public and said, we should have an investigation. When Cynthia McKinney found out about election fraud nationwide being run by elements of the U.S. government, she went public. And she's a real congresswoman. She's the type of person we need. I tried to warn the American people of the dangers that I saw emanating from this administration. For that, a known black female Republican was advised to run against me in the Democratic primary. Republicans fed her campaign coffers and then 48,000 of them crossed over and voted for her. Just think about it. Katherine Harris, who participated in the illegal disfranchisement of innocent black and Latino voters, was rewarded with a congressional seat, and I was taken out of one. So if you're a real Republican who has populist constitutional views, you're targeted. If you're a real Democrat who has real constitutional values and cares about the people, like Cynthia McKinney, you're targeted, you're attacked for getting out of the controlled paradigm. And I'm telling you, the controlled paradigm is the insane worldview. We see ludicrous leaders like Tom DeLay, Trent Lott, Ward Connolly, and now Arnold Schwarzenegger parade across the stage adorned with the ornaments of power while thoughtful leaders are shunned or targeted or cruelly maligned. But there was a time when that truly wasn't so. When our leaders challenged the best in us and encouraged us to shun war and invest in justice and peace. And Cynthia McKinney has been an ardent supporter of the Bill of Rights and has really spoken out against these modern tyrannies. So we have to commend her. This is absolute gold right here. Excuse me, y'all gonna the, put the incredible hype. Off a of property, this is private property. Okay, where's your property? 15 feet from the foundation. So you guys done blowing the economy up? Now you're just guarding a little money laundering scam? That's Enron, CIA money laundering. And they don't even want you to videotape their little Enron logo. Can you believe it? the exercise of power. And once our constitutional rights are gone, they'll have these guys dressed up in black uniforms 
busting through your door, telling you you're wrong after they're done destroying the entire stock market. That's how the scam's gonna work here in the new third world country that is America. See, the media, CNN, all of them told you, invest in Enron, it's the biggest thing, it's the best thing, when really it was a Ponzi scheme. They were consolidating. They were taking all of the assets of the population, the pension funds, putting them in the company, then using those assets to buy other real assets and transferring it into other companies. Then when they're done, they burn the house down and cover up their evidence. And then they have a whitewash in Congress where they talk about issues of little or no significance and distract you off the real facts. Where are the assets? And why aren't people talking about how two years ago they started transferring them into real companies? This is what we're dealing with here, ladies and gentlemen. This is the scam. Here, let's interview this gentleman. He'll probably know more about Enron than the average corporate executive. And I'm serious when I say that. What exactly do you think is really going on with Enron? You, have, uh, <laughs> you, have, uh, you can tell me. <laughs> I really couldn't tell you what's going on with Enron. The only thing I can tell you about Enron is that certain people have certain assets in certain places, and they're really not disclosing where their assets set to protect their assets. <laughs> now that's incredible. No one in the media is really talking about wherever the assets transferred years before, before <laughs> they decided to blow this thing out. It's like, oh, they're all gone, run on the bank. Here it is, again, out of the mouths of babes. He knows exactly what he's talking about. You're on target. I knew we'd get the exact key <laughs> focused answer we can never get from anybody else. You got to find the actual employees that was really working here to find out where the target is. <laughs> the population thinks that Enron is about a company that went belly up, it was a run on the bank. Couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is it's a giant CIA globalist money laundering operation that I and others were talking about years ago. It's a Ponzi scheme. They take your pension funds, your investment, they buy up power companies, pipelines, you name it, consolidate it, transfer it to other real companies that their interests control. Then they blow out the entire company, have some stage managed theatrical event whitewashes in Congress, and you buy it. Don't buy it for a single solitary second because more economic crises are coming. This is how the scam is pulled. Just like 1929 America, I assure you, the stock market is not safe. I mean, you can buy anything with assets. You can buy anything in H Town. Exactly, real tangible stuff. They've been transferring and then they blew the dummy scheme out after the last old lady invested money in it because their stockbroker said it's the best. CNN says it and you can trust them. They care when you're you, you can't trust CNN. I mean, really, it's wrong to even speak out against this, against this CIA money laundering operation. The neighborhood I grew up in, Boyle Heights in East LA and Los Angeles, police weren't necessarily our friends. I think the, the experiences we had growing up that they weren't always there to necessarily help you first. You know, there, there were situations you'd find yourself in that just seemed unfair. I, I think that, the, you know, it has a lot to do with, with money and the perception that that gives people. As people with money um, are less likely to be aggressive physically than poor people and I think that that, uh, that stereotype is kind of carried out in, in a lot of the way. Well, I would add to that, though, because I've, I've interviewed a lot of police. The establishment also has said that people that fit the stereotype of being poor or disadvantaged are easier to abuse, and then there aren't lawsuits and they don't get in sure, trouble. Sure, I mean, it's, it, the, the legal system, it costs a lot of money to represent yourself. Money does make a difference. And yes, my friends, there really is an Illuminati. There really are 13 families. They own the big banks that print the money. And they have stated publicly that they plan to get all of us, that's 95 to 80% of us, out of the way to engineer a servant class and to totally take control of the evolutionary development of the human species. Well, I, I, you know, I'm not sure I believe in what you're saying there, Alex. It, it seems a little far-fetched to me. 
All one has to do is investigate FEMA, read the founding documents. It's been around since 1933, though they gave it the name in 1979. And I've got Senate hearings on tape where they talk about the concentration camps that uh, FEMA is involved in constructing and maintaining. In fact, the agencies that were merged to create FEMA were the agencies that actually kept the Japanese Americans during World War II in internment camps. And FEMA's already activated. Uh, four days after September 11th, uh, President Bush activated uh, 500 dormant clauses, activating all of the FEMA powers. Uh, FEMA can take over every radio, television station, every transmission, um, satellite uplink since 96. I don't think that FEMA would ever have the power to, to uh, impose any kind of martial law. Um, that's only can be authorized by an act of Congress. And so I don't really see how the transfer of power would happen unless you're talking about an well, actual military true. takeover that's not the true. NSC. Go read the executive orders on how, FEMA. How would it happen? Uh, look, it's already happening. The bunkers are in command right I'm now. Get out of here. It's where Cheney is. <laughs> look, it's incremental. But... Let me tell you something. I think the biggest problem in this country is not FEMA. I think it's people's ignorance of their own government and the lack of civic I agree. I agree. Yeah, people need to... I agree with it. Well, look, Schieber, look, look, it's not says, FEMA. It's who runs FEMA. It's the, yeah. it's the forces behind and who this runs, power. They could use any kind of government job to, 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 to mess with people's lives. The government can use the IRA, IRS to destroy you. Exactly. They can use the military. It's just one more CIA. tool in their box. He's, so he's, he's on target. I'm in agree. I agree. Of, Go read the executive orders. Dude, we Take. may be strung out on watching sitcoms and Wheel of Fortune and drinking beer, but the American people would get their act together and they are. Some ass they are. If the government Liberals tries to do that. Liberals and conservatives are coming together like I've never are there, seen are, them come are, together because people are worried about this. And more and more of what Congress does, more and more of the checks and balances are being removed in the name of dealing with the crisis. Now, I want the Speaker of the House and Leader of the Senate to be involved in the continuity of government program. They've gone public. They were very upset about it. So we got a problem here when the Speaker of the House, a Republican, and the Leader of the Senate, a Democrat, are okay. both. Why right. well, 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 we keep talking about like how FEMA is going to take over the government and stuff. I'm just wondering exactly how will they do that? You haven't quite explained that yet. Again, it's by incrementalism. They're not going to announce they're taking over. Incrementally, they've been doing it. And by using disasters, especially uh, terrorist attacks, it would be uh, quite easy uh, to expand the power to condition the people to accept that level of tyranny. So it's through crises, through problem, reaction, solution, that we would see an expanded takeover. But how? How are they going to do it? Well, it's a Richter scale of, of, of martial law, of tyranny. I'd say we're at about, about five or six right now, and the mercury's rising. Uh, again, Ashcroft. John Ashcroft, you're talking about taking away civil liberties bit by little bit by little bit. And I think a lot of uh, my, my Democratic friends are a bit too hysterical about what's gone down. But, um, well, again, I'm, I'm not a Democrat, but I see no evidence I. of any of this. I see no evidence I of any of that. Of what? Yeah, what evidence? Is okay. I mean, I, USA I, I, Patriot Act. Now a threat overseas could end up being a threat to the homeland. And in order to protect the homeland, these good people have got to be able to share information. Those who criticize the Patriot Act must listen to those of folks on the front line of defending America. The Patriot Act defends our liberty, is what it does, under the Constitution of the United States. They'll swear up and down a bill is going to give you more freedom. And it's actually uh, giving you a lot less. They'll have a they'll have a bill that's supposed to give you more privacy. And what they're doing is they're turning over your information to the government. In the Patriot Act, Section 802 says that all crimes are an act of terrorism. And now it's in the news. They're using it to go after strip bar owners, county commissioners who might have taken a payoff for zoning rules, uh, zit-faced kids who were found with a bag of marijuana. They're charging thousands of people under the Patriot Act that have no connection in any way to acts of terrorism. They can talk all day about how the Patriot Act is for evil Arab terrorists that are gonna kill us any minute if we don't submit to the nice men in black ski mask. But we've all seen evidence. Mike Wallace calmly argues with somebody who's complaining about his limo driver double parked and he's savagely arrested by the taxi police. We've got a woman in D.C. walking on to a subway station and the police tell her, hey, you can't eat a candy bar on the subway. She says, okay, pops it into her mouth. They arrest her and say that she was chewing aggressively. This was actually in the Associated Press. Right here in Austin, Texas, this Pakistani guy with no criminal record, his family lives here in Austin, came to town. He videotaped the Capitol and the governor's mansion and it was a national alert, you know, on Fox. 
It's all over. The Pakistanis are videotaping. Well, every time I'm a tourist visiting family, I, I videotape things. It turned out the guy wasn't a threat. But this is used to boost the terror alert and to, to scare everybody. So we have the precedent being set. You eat a candy bar wrong. You argue with the taxi police uh, about where you're parked, you get arrested. All of this, what does this have to do with America and freedom? Bottom line, look at the climate around you. We're all being treated like slaves by those who, in truth, are the terrorists. You see, that's the common sense. Who stands to gain from this threat? Who stands to gain from the threat of terrorism? The military industrial complex. At the Congress a few weeks ago, before it left on recess, by a three to one margin, passed an amendment that effectively struck down the sneak and peek section of the bill which gives government the right to go in to somebody's house without a warrant without announcing in effect that you're going doing a search which uh, according to you know according to our bill of rights uh, people have to be notified and so i'm moving forward to strike down all those sections which effectively knock out the bill of rights we're going to reclaim the bill of rights by canceling the patriot act key provisions of the patriot act are set to expire next year the terrorist threat. And let me tell you something. These people have said, Rand Corporation and others have said, the entire economy will be prisons, police in black ski masks, a Nazi Germany-like nightmare. It makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up to talk about it, to read what's in Patriot Act 1 and 2, to see what Homeland Security does, Victory Act 1 and 2. We have got to get the word out now. We have got to warn everybody because this military industrial complex and their PNAC and their NORTHCOM plans state that they will carry out the terror, that they will engineer the crises so that they can offer their solution. Will it take another terrorist attack uh, to get Victory Act and Patriot Act 2 passed? Uh, that's a heck of a question to have to answer, but they'll be ready. If there is another attack, they're going to be ready. But right now, I think that they cannot get it passed because they're sort of on the defensive because of this magnificent vote we had to repeal some of the uh, Patriot Act. One day after the Patriot Act was passed, the world got to see a copy of it because no member of Congress was allowed to read it. It was transmitted from the Justice Department, much of it uh, written, they admitted, years before, to the Congress. It was passed while the Capitol building was under anthrax attack. Five of the six office buildings were shut down. About 60 to 70 percent of the Capitol itself was shut down. There were federal protective forces literally running around with Heckler and Koch MP5 submachine guns wearing black ski masks and Nazi Kurzel helmets inside of the structure. It was a federal takeover. Turns out the anthrax all the evidence shows was sent under order of the White House to the Capitol to create the smoke screen so they could pass this legislation. Bush, of course, and his entire cabinet were on Cipro, the anthrax fighting antibiotic. There should be a uh, campaign to throw this administration out for violating constitutional principles, which have been the basis of this nation's civic dialogue and legal protection for over 200 years. And so that's where the energy, energy should go. Uh, I'm doing everything I can as a member of Congress to raise the awareness of this issue. And frankly, all over this country, you've had over 100 cities pass resolutions that have condemned the Patriot Act. And it's a bipartisan effort, I might add. It's just that members of this administration and their desire to create fear and control have rushed headlong into this challenge to our basic liberties. I think the way that you ultimately solve it is to get rid of the administration which doesn't respect the Bill of Rights. We're making good progress in the defense of America. We've got a Department of Homeland Security that now enables people to better coordinate and cooperate and share information. We've got a Patriot Act, which needs to be renewed, by the way, that, uh, and strengthened in my judgment, that uh, is uh, uh, really important to allow uh, the criminal division and the intelligence division of the FBI to share information, which they could not do before. Uh, but the Patriot Act helps. It helps us to be able to, to be able to connect the dots, as the common phrase here in Washington. Uh, these provisions of the Patriot Act are important to national security. 
and for this country to begin to forget that uh, national security requires a robust capacity for law enforcement would be a major tragedy. Right in my hometown of Austin, Texas, we just threw out the Patriot Act. It's over 400 cities. It's over 400 cities. It's not 170. It's not 250. It's over 400 cities and towns. Just to clear up any confusion, we have shot this film over the last, well, actually, year plus. And so you'll hear us talk about 100 cities, 150, 300 cities. The news is usually four or five months behind. But the latest news reports are reporting 300 plus cities have thrown out the Patriot Act in their towns and four states. Now, eight months ago, it was over 400 cities because I've actually counted them all up. But let's be conservative. 300 plus have thrown out the Patriot Act and four states. And that's very, very exciting because all we're saying is, hey, America is in America if we don't have these basic liberties. And that's why you should throw out the Patriot Act and reaffirm the Bill of Rights in your town. Alex Jones and several folks have tried, or will be donating time to Mr. Jones, Let's, but our rules are they have to be present to do so. Sean Lousen, is Sean Lousen here? Eliza Giles, Eliza, Eliza? Mayor, Giles. I had about 20 that we can- Denise Keeper Lousen, Carlos Tame, okay, Carla, okay. How about Mark Wallace? Well, that's, so far that's only six of the five people that attempted, Mr. Jones, to give you three minutes. Only two are here, so you have six additional minutes. I'll give you nine, well, unless, unless somebody else- Mayor, I go with. outside and get people. I think folks kind of got, I mean- Are you signed up to speak? What's your name? Trevor Holly. Okay, I need one more person. What's your name, ma'am? Rebecca, I'm sorry, what's the last name? Okay. Okay. So, Mr. Jones, you're now at your maximum of 15 minutes. I will I just will say, folks, occasionally you'll see um, myself or council members leaving the dais. I promise you when we're back uh, in the back, there's a, a television and audio we can hear and see. Oh, so yes, don't, Mayor, don't be, I, I believe you. Don't be offended <laughs> when I leave. I'm not offended. Welcome, Mr. Jones. You have 15 minutes. Well, thank you. And I hope you do stay because this is important. And I want to thank the people that came here that are part of the second American Revolution. We shall prevail. That is a guarantee. Because, because as the New World Order turns up the heat, they're going to form more resistance. The tighter they squeeze, the more people are going to have that light bulb go off above their head. Now, I believe this council is made up of good people, and I think it's great that uh, Jackie Goodman, Mayor Pro Tem, has brought this forward. Let's go through the facts. And John Ashcroft and Lord Bush and their military industrial complex owners who are setting up a military dictatorship, I mean, this is admitted, PNAC documents, cannot hide the reality of what's happening. In fact, Ashcroft, six months ago, really committed a federal crime. In sworn testimony for the House and Senate, he said there is no new terrorism legislation. It's not been introduced. The Domestic Security Enhancement Act, the Justice Domestic Security Enhancement Act, House and Senate versions. It's like if I got up here and said the sun didn't come up this morning. You'd laugh at me, but the press didn't call him on it. Now he's saying there is a Patriot Act 2 and Victory Act 1 and Victory Act 2, and you better pass all of them. You know what's in Patriot Act 2, Section 501? You fit the description of a terrorist under Section 802 of the first Patriot Act. You can be arrested secretly executed. That's right, a three military judge panel. Now what is Section 802 of the first Patriot Act? It passed on October 27, 2001 at five in the morning when no one was allowed to read it, according to members of Congress. The definition of terrorist is any action that endangers human life that is a violation of any federal or state law. They have many other definitions about anything that influences government. Go read it for yourself. They're counting on you not reading it. They're counting on you not finding it. Ron Paul and others have pointed out that Hitler and Stalin and people didn't have the nerve to put stuff like this down on paper. They just did it. That's what's so amazing about this. And to see the assistant U.S. attorney here uh, peddling this is really sad, but I know it's under orders. 
because two months ago it was reported that Ashcroft met out in Hollywood with the heads, the big editors of all the newspapers and the heads of law enforcement and said, we'd like you to go out and write editorials, editors, we'd like U.S. attorneys, assistant attorneys, write editorials, get on talk shows, uh, get out there and sell that this is the people, this is good, this is a wonderful thing. So I want the council, in case you don't know this, and the people here today to understand that it's a stage managed event. I mean, it really was hatched in a smoky room to, to oppress you, to manipulate you, to con you. Now that makes me very angry, and that's why it's so exciting that this council may simply just say we have a Bill of Rights and Constitution, and we will not violate the Bill of Rights and Constitution, and in this city, America is still America. I mean, it's just that simple. The very first thing the Patriot Act does is allows the FBI and the CIA and Department of Justice and other agencies to cooperate with each other and share information so that we can make sure we can spot, identify terrorists, and hopefully prevent Why terrorists. Why have 300 House members then rejected it? But in the middle of our conversation, activist Alex Jones called the assistant attorney a liar. Section 802 affects all citizens. It's for all crimes. It's for, it's for, it's for, it's for, it's for one marijuana cigarette. These guys haven't read it. Have you read it? Can you respect this guy for a second? No, you know how this stuff works, guys. I'm not going to sit here and hear this guy spew lies. See, this is, they don't want to talk to me. You need to answer real questions. You need to answer real questions instead of lying. And you know, earlier I talked to you, you know what's in Section 802. You know. Wait, can, we, can you guys your title again? There's one thing that's for sure. If you don't get involved, you'll never make a difference. But by getting involved, I believe we still can make a difference. And now is not the time for us to give up on our political system. Like, they have the law and the government and everything on their side. And uh, I think there has to be a shift on the other, on our side, as far as making them accountable for their actions. So putting ourselves against the machinery and saying no. Civil disobedience. Basically, you know, and that's, you know, supposedly what this country is all about, right? Civil disobedience, you know, sometimes it's necessary, you know, in a society to um, question, uh, rise, and, and hopefully change things. The, the pyramid, you know, the power is derived from the feder from the feds. It's a it's an it's a, a rampant executive mindlessness. The, the federal police and military entities looking to just completely erode our civil liberties on the on the base. But at the bottom of the pyramid, that's where the strength is. And as long as people are become aware of these situations and begin to move in in very kind of distinct and, and rational ways, there's no reason that you can't create a SWAT watch in your town. We need to preempt. Uh, their ability to preempt our, our right to, uh, to to protest, to have uh, you know re have our grievances redressed, and uh, you know, and in order to exercise our freedom, there is an inherent contradiction between democracy and militarism, and whether or not uh, you know we are left, right, or center, everyone should be concerned that the increasing level of violence on the grassroots. So I would suggest that people just get educated around these uh, these issues. And, uh, and take hope and, and fight back. There is but one special interest that we should be working for, and that would solve just about all of our problems, and that is our liberty. In 2004, in November, there's going to be an election and there's going to be an outcome. Now, for people who can say, who want to say, well, we don't have confidence in the system. We don't have confidence that our votes are going to be counted. That's all the more reason to participate more heavily and investigate and investigate we don't have a crystal ball we don't know the future but we've studied human history and regardless of who wins the november election in 2004 the new world order wins whether it's george walker bush or john forbes heinz Carey, the establishment wins and that's the message we try to get across to you it's important for all of us at a grassroots level to get involved and cause a renaissance, an awakening to this fact. It's so important to realize that we need to go down to the basic foundations of freedom and liberty and get past the label or the name on the politician. Bottom line, are you freer today than you were a year ago? And unfortunately, the answer is no. We don't know who's going to win this election, but we do know they all serve the new world order and need to be resisted. So stop letting them use this tag team fake professional wrestling 
theater on you and wake up to the real world. Break on through to the other side. You're free and freedom is beautiful. And uh, you know, it'll take time to restore chaos and order, but we order out of chaos, but we will. Thanks a lot, Kevin. That was a talking here in Malibu, uh, outside LA, to, uh, well, Gary Busey, been in over uh, 100 films. 107. 107. And, and, <laughs> and, and how many incredible awards? That just. Doesn't matter. The awards don't matter. The, gut, the, the uh, notches on the gun butt doesn't matter. What matters is right now, N O W. And, right, and the word now stands for no other way.